Hello everyone. My name is Sandra Collins and I'm the Director of the National Library of Ireland and it's my great honour to welcome you all this evening to our online event, the fifth in our Living with Pride programme. Living with Pride is a flagship project for the National Library this year. It represents a commitment to diversity and inclusion and specifically to LGBTI plus equality. We hope that through this project, we will raise awareness of the Irish Queer Archive and the LGBTI plus collections, which we care for in the National Library, including collections like the Christopher Robson Photographic Collection, the Marriage Equality Campaign Papers, the Born Digital Marriage Equality Photographic Archive, amongst many, many more. These collections form part of the memory of Ireland, and it's an honour to hold them in trust and to find ways to explore and promote them and to encourage people to engage with and to be inspired by them. There are a number of elements to Living with Pride. Today is the fifth panel discussion in the Living with Pride year long programme of events. This programme is co-curated by Tony Walsh and it's an ambitious and it's wide ranging and it ranges from events like Drag Story Time to workshops on the Ar Irish Queer Archive and discussions about activism, representation and identity. And I'd really like to thank Tony for the vision that he has brought to this programme. Last month, we launched the Living with Pride exhibition. That's an exhibition of the Christopher Robson Photographic Collection, which contains over 2000 slides, mostly taken at Pride events in Ireland between 1992 and 2007. The collection was donated to us by Christopher's partner, Bill Foley, and Bill worked with us to co-curate the exhibition. The photographs are now all fully digitised and available to view in our online catalogue. And the exhibition is in the National Library's photographic archive in Meeting House Square in Temple Bar. And it's open seven days a week from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's free to visit and we would love to see you there. So please pop in if you can. But just in case you can't, the exhibition is also fully digitised and you can visit online at any time, no matter where you are in the world. We're also delighted to be partnering with Kurt International Festival of Literature and to have Sean Hewitt as our first poet in residence based at the Irish Queer Archive. Sean is going to explore some of the stories contained in that archive through poetry. And I'm delighted to say his first event with us takes place next week on Tuesday. Overall, our approach to developing Living with Pride has been guided by the principle of nothing about us without us. And I'm very grateful to our co-curators and our partners and to shout out who provided training for our teams. And I also really want to thank um, the great staff in the National Library who have worked so hard on this. We also recognise that there's much more work to do in our diversity and inclusion programme. And this is something that we'll be continuing to work on in the coming years. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our chair this evening, Catherine O'Donnell. Catherine is Associate Professor in the History of Ideas in UCD School of Philosophy. She has published widely on the history of gender and sexuality, and she was a founder member of the Irish Queer Archive. Since 1997, she has been a key organiser of the Lesbian Lives Conference, which is being held in UCC in March 22 next. She's also a member of the Academic Advisory Group, uh, Advocacy Group, Justice for Magdalene's Research, who together have written Ireland and the Magdalene Laundries, a campaign for justice. It's a great honour to have you chairing this event, Catherine. I hand over to you Thanks, and thank you. Thanks and uh, welcome everybody. Um, it's my delight and honour to get to moderate tonight and to introduce our three wonderful panellists. So the topic that we're discussing um, and that we invite you to get engaged with right now is the role of art um, and media in our lives as queer people in terms of 
How does it um, reflect on on our issues of visibility uh, and representation, but also, I suppose, a more general question of what place do various kinds of art forms and media have in our queer lives? Um, so with me to discuss those uh, um, issues are Evgeny Storm, Storn. Uh, he's a writer and activist, researcher from St. Petersburg. Um, it was due to his involvement in civil society work that he was forced to leave Russia in 2018. And it was Ireland's gain. In 2019, he was granted international protection um, in the Republic of Ireland. So he works as a social and cultur cultural diversity consultant. And he collaborates with different universities and NGOs, such as my own university, UCD, NUI Galway, and uh, the Equality Fund at Rethink Ireland. He co-facilitates a really interesting project with people currently seeking asylum in the Republic of Ireland, something from there. Um, and that project is ongoing with the National Gallery of Ireland. So Evgeny has been published in many academic journals, anthologies, and new media outlets. In, not just in Ireland or in Russia, but also in Spain and Germany. As an activist, he's been involved in human rights and LGBT ag advocacy for almost two decades. So I guess he started that when he was about 10. Um, he's co-founder of Queer Diaspora Ireland, and that's an initiative that supports LGD LGBT people in direct provision. In 2019, he was awarded the Inclusion Award by Galway Community Pride. And last year, 2020, uh, Evgeny Storn was awarded the Gala's Person of the Year by the National LGBT Federation of Ireland, N NXF. He's also a member of the Board of Directors of Dublin Prime. Um, Ruby O'Brien um, is with us tonight from uh, London. Um, originally born in Tralee, County Kerry, she's a very proud member of the LGBT community and also a very proud member of the travelling community not often represented indeed in our LGBT aura. So you're doubly welcome, Ruby. She's a human rights activist and a proud transgender woman. And finally, tonight we have Jo Kathleen, um, known to many of us um, uh, who were active during the um, uh, referendum in 2015 around equal marriage for his iconic um, paper, black and white, uh, massive image um, just opposite the, the gay spar there on South Great Georgia Street as it meets Dame Street. Beautiful image of two young men embracing. Um, a particularly kind of poignant and powerful image at a particularly poignant and tough time for many of us involved in that referendum campaign. So Joe is an Irish street artist. He's an, also an art teacher and, of course, an activist. He's known for those beautifully rendered pencil drawings. Um, which often manifest as towering pieces of street art. His accessible work <clears throat> engages directly with social issues of modern Ireland and on a scale is so massive that it's unavoidable. So Castlin confronts subjects of suicide, drug addiction, economic marginalisation, marriage equality, stigma and mental health, direct provision, institutional power, and issues of consent, and most recently, the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on young people. So the monochrome drawings that, that Joe Castlin creates live with us and face us um, for a time before, as they're done on paper, washing away and, uh, and under, under the forces of nature. But they also, as they last, they hold a mirror up to the kind of society that we are, and provoking us to ask ourselves as individuals what kind of society we want to be part of. So all three of you are very, very welcome. Um, what we're going to do to kind of kick things off before we see comments and questions coming in from people online with us here tonight, we're going to go in, in alphabetical order. First you, Evgeny, then you, Joe, and then you, Ru Ruby. And I just want to ask you, well, what is the role of art and media in your career life? How do you use it? Do you, um, yeah, how do you use it and what forms particularly engage you? So, Evgeny, would you like to take that up? Thank you. Thank you very much. First, first of all, thank you for taking 10 years out of uh, <laughs> my actual age. <laughs> I would be happy <laughs> be uh, 10, 20 years ago, but um, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, uh, 
art that is inspiring or that was inspiring because I think it it really shifted over the years significantly and in a uh, uh, very recent post-Soviet uh, space that was, you know, everything was crushing, everything was disappearing. There were no even electricity and gas, you know, there were no no access to anything in the 90s and the, when the Soviet Union crashed, you know, people were really in the lost because in one day we basically found ourselves in a completely unknown uh, reality of the newborn capitalism in the post-socialist in the space. So uh, th- they were nothing. They were absolutely nothing at that time. And the, 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 the discovery that was, for me, the magic mountain of Thomas Mann, which was an absolutely, mm. an absolutely a coincidence. I never pretended that, you know, I knew anything. I just was at the uh, uh, at the friend's house, or the friends of my mother, and they had a recollection of Thomas Mann uh, uh, novels and uh, things. And I, I, I discovered years after the Death and Venice, and I understood the, the, what Thomas Mann is. But at that time, I was 14 years old. I wasn't able to understand that novel that I reread mm-hmm. 20 years later. And uh, uh, But it somehow, I digged into that, and that was the first time when something resonates. Something, you know, it's it's so subtle. There is nothing really there about homosexuality, but there is something between Gans Kasterp and his cousin, and there is something in the air, and between certain, you know, there is a lot of things going on in that uh, uh, in Davos, uh, in that sanatorium for people with tuberculosis, uh, and. I don't know, like this was maybe the first time when me being uh, 14 years already completely aware of my sexuality person, when something so subtle, so invisible, so not named, were appealing to that sense of you are not alone, you know, because this is the first feeling that we as LGBT uh, Mm -hmm. uh, people, uh, we very often, maybe not now, but in, in 90s, in that 90s, in that geographical location, it was a sense that I am the only one who are not lucky yeah. to be, uh, you know, not like everyone else. And this is uh, where art is so needed. And if we speak about right now and what is happening right now, I probably wouldn't discover RuPaul without uh, uh, quarantine and the lockdown and the, you know the, the necessity to be at home and spend at home so many hours, uh, uh, especially the, 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 the winter of this year. But somehow uh, I was suggested to, 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 to take a look. I, have to recognize, I knew almost nothing. And that was the whole... I've never heard of RuPaul and Bulgaria. Wow, okay. uh, Yes, yes, you know, I'm coming from Russia where it, 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 at least uh, like uh, three, four, five years ago, I don't think a lot of people were, it may be very subcultural thing. It wasn't a phenomenon yet, Mm -hmm. at least in Russia. And uh, so I came without this knowledge. I heard something about him already in Ireland, but I never, never took that much attention, paid that much attention to him. And uh, so, yes, he discovered, and I think he plays a lot with the representation and the idea of representation and the idea of, you know, I'm representing this community, that community, which I am particularly struggling with. I, I don't know if I represent any community, and I don't know if I'm comfortable representing any community, and I don't know if it's all right to represent anyone, because... I, I even have a problem with the very idea of community, but anyway, uh, uh, what I do, what I do like about RuPaul is that somehow he manages to bring together the very political discourse and very aesthetical, and, and, and both are fresh, at least to me. They are very fresh. 
And this is what I like about art, most of all. The ability of the art to be fresh, regardless of when it was produced. And I'm sorry for sound like a butcher, you know, but it is important when the art is fresh and it smells fresh, you know, because unfortunately there is a lot of outdated art, but there is a lot of art which is, which, which freshness is kind of, it, like, it's like an air, you know, it liberates, it somehow makes you just breathe differently. And uh, all cultures possess uh, this this ability and, and Irish culture, of course, too, and Russian and the Spanish. And it, this is something that I think somehow makes us, uh, I don't know, feel this connection to the, to the, to the, to the other generations, to the, the very idea of being a human. And like that air in Davos that Hans Kastor uh, found, you know, this, this idea of freshness, this is what I would, what inspires me most. As wow, LGBT that's, that's or as whatever I am, you know. So, so art for you has, has this kind of ambivalent dual charge of letting you know you're not alone, that you're in a tradition and yet hitting you with immediate see and novelty and freshness. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. You, you, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you for putting it uh, <laughs> more, oh, more uh, Christian. Thank you. Yeah. Um, art kind of... Um... So you're the only practitioner amongst us really, or, or admitted practitioner. Maybe, maybe um, it's like maybe I think. Have a, I, I think yeah. uh, being kind of queer or kind of trying to understand that, um, it came. It, it was always a very negative thing. So it was like you know, kind of. I came from rural Ireland. It was you know, being different was always a very, very negative thing. It was always you know, kind of the one lad that might be gay that was in the town, or those that wore were very, very much known and pointed. Um, and it was such a direct and hurtful thing. And it's, at times I was kind of, you know, knew that that was me, but then pulled so far away from it that, you know, kind of was crushing myself. And there was a, there was a show that came on uh, called Queer as Folk in the late 90s, the very late 90s or 2000. And it was like that little spark of joy. It was, I never knew that that was what life could be or could offer the fun or the madness and the, you know, the, the, but I remember we had this tiny little television in the kitchen and I was kind of sitting in beside it, like kind of hunkered in in case anyone had come in the door so I could press the channel real quick before I'd be able to turn it off. Um, and that was, you know, so the, the, the kind of lens based media was that kind of, opening that that allowed me to see the positivity that was in being queer um and then when i got to college so you know kind of i i left rural ireland i left for scammon and, and went to dublin to go to art college and it was there that you know kind of i came across artists like um robert mapplethorpe or keith haring um i even found out about um you know kind of like frida Kahlo and her journey through gender and you know kind of ethnicity and um mm -hmm. and then kind of being queer has always framed every single thing that i put on a wall you know from to be othered to be to know what that walk is like you know to to walk in the shoes of being you know kind of that that you don't have full access or that you're seen as slightly different or legislation isn't in place or you're you're seen as lesser um, that has always been a big influence on the artwork that I have that I create. So whether it is those with direct provision or just the piece that I put on the wall, finished off putting it on the wall yesterday about Down syndrome Ireland, um, or those that live in Ireland that have Down syndrome, it's it's to ask the audience, you know, to stand in someone else's shoes and and just see what it's like from their perspective. And it's my queerness that has given me that power. Um, mm -hmm. that I can do that, that I can create artwork that does have that empathy, that does have that power. And before, when I was younger, I used to think of myself as lesser. 
And now, in a way, sometimes I see that that thing that made me lesser is now my superpower. It's the thing that makes me better, um, which is lovely. Um, mm. And it's nice to go into the classroom and to be, you know, able to show my artwork and to show who I am and just to, you know, kind of to allow others that, that might be there to look for the faces and the visibility that wasn't there when I was growing up that is now there. Um, same with, you know, kind of everyone really that's, that's on, you know, that, that's, that's here on the call tonight. Um, I'd say nearly all of our journeys have been nearly the exact same. Mm -hmm. I love that, Joe, the, the queer superpower of empathy. So Ruby, can you hear us? Yep. I was just uh, asking how has art or media been important for you in your journey, your life? Now we um, gotcha. I actually like to, I actually like to pose, do you know, pose. Oh, yeah, I do very yeah, well. I really like, I, I, I've only like I always thought I was like you know, like a gay male because my mother and father would never you know like put anything on that. I come from a private community, so I never I, I only discovered like in 2018 that I was trans. You get me because you mm -hmm. know I, yeah. my family weren't, but they'd never leave any. I didn't know anything about it. They'd never leave anything on TV. So I just thought because I liked it men that I was you know that I was gay, but I wasn't. I was actually transgender, you know, and I did different. Yeah. I always things opposite from you know what men did you know what I'm on about yeah and I basically I how I discovered that I was trans it was it was actually posed wow yeah so so you're somebody like like the other two have gone before you who who saw a mirror um, yeah who saw a potential of how you could be something that resonated that that told you yeah you're a part of this tribe and that was uh, yeah. watching those, yeah. Yeah, I, and, and, um, who I actually really look up to was Dominique Jackson. Do you know her? Yeah. Yeah. And and what was it like for you when you, can you remember when you, so Joe described like huddling into the, the TV set. What was it like for you when you first found Pose? It was like I was really into it. Like, you know, I could stop watching it. I watched it four or five times over and over, all the two seasons. You know, like I, it was you know, like it was me, like you know, the, it was stuff like me. You know, I don't know, it just felt like me. You know, I, I could start watching it. I was so interested about it. And then I start searching up and following them on social media, and you know, looking at other things that they've did on like TV shows and documentaries. And, you know, I just became really, you know, like that's how I kind of discovered that I was trans. You know, mm -hmm. because I, I come from a very old fashioned community, and um, they don't really, you know. You, you're not like my father and mother would never allow anything that about gays or queers or trans on television. So I could never discover that what I was. All I knew that I liked men, so I discovered I thought I was gay, but I wasn't. I was actually trans, and I think I think there's not a lot of people to look up, look up to in Ireland. That, you know, you trans. You don't really see many people that are like trans in Ireland on TV shows. Like you rarely ever see anything like that. Do you know what I'm on about? Very very and, true. Uh, yeah. No. Especially like I'm the first Irish traveler transgender, so it is kind of very hard for me because a lot of people know me from the community, and the world is getting a lot more accepting. But I feel like there's a still a lot of stigma towards people like me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you know, um, it, you know, over the decades, um, uh, visibility for lesbians it used to be one of our kind of big rallying calls that we there was absolutely no representation and we've gone mm -hmm. from zero representation to people like ellen having a daily american breakfast show um yeah. so i wish the same things for 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 trans visibility um and what about so evgeny was talking about rupaul uh, so as a trans woman um i can really understand how pose is, is obviously a place that you would go to what would your relationship mm. be to, to the RuPaul Drag Race? I actually enjoy it. I watched that as well. Um, I actually met mm -hmm. someone from RuPaul, the English RuPaul Drag Race. Um, George, the drag queen. Yeah. Uh, Cherry yeah. Valentine. Cherry Valentine. I've met, I've met him, actually, and I did a documentary with him. And we're just waiting to finish off the rest of the documentary. And, um, yeah, you know, he, he, he was on RuPaul Drag Race the UK. He met RuPaul. And um, I like RuPaul. So, so do you think there's kind of an overlap with the stuff that RuPaul does and trans visibility, or that it's? Yeah, I think it's similar in ways, but I feel like 
there is a lot more like there's a, sl- a lot of stigma to gay people, but I feel like there's a lot more stigma to trans and queer people. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like there's a certain amount of transgender women murdered every single year in the United States and stuff. Do you know what I'm about? Yeah. And um, I've had a few I've had a few transphobic attacks in England and Ireland. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people are not really new to they're very new to the transgender part. Like they're not really they're just they think it's a man put a, put a wig on their head, like they're not really do you know what I'm on about? Yeah, yeah. They, they think basically they think it's drag queens. I think they they you know it's mixed up with drag queens. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I was kind of you know, trying to hint at, I suppose. Um, do you think maybe RuPaul in some ways causes a bit of a bit of problems for trans women? Yeah, it does because uh, RuPaul actually looks very feminine while when when he's in drag. And I feel like a lot of people Ru- RuPaul's very popular, so a lot of people would think RuPaul is a transgender woman. Do you know what I'm mm-hmm. on about? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. uh where they get mixed up there, like especially people in Ireland, like they're very laid back and old fashioned. Do you get me? Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. So you you would be calling for kind of for more media representation about the specific identities and experiences of yeah. a whole range of different kinds of trans women. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of of what you you're reading or listening to now, Evgeny, besides RuPaul, can you recommend anything else for people to engage um, with? To be honest, I RuPaul and Paul are the only kind of things that I watch really. And <laughs> yeah, I, maybe I maybe like... Evgeny can 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 suggest stuff, and I'm going to ask you as well, Joe. Um, so we've we've got it from Ruby um, Pose. So for those of you who haven't heard of Pose, it's on Netflix, isn't that right, Ruby? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Evgeny, what, Actually, what, what in particular are you looking at now or consuming, if we can use that word, engaged with? Yeah, well, one of the recent uh, books that I read uh, that would be kind of uh, um, good to mention in this conversation is uh, the lost autobiography of Samuel Stewart which was um, a very the internal... The lost autobiography of Samuel Stewart. The lost autobiography, yes. He wrote an autobiography, and there is a manuscript of that. And then he published some chapters of it. But then another uh, person, I think, I don't remember in which university in the United States, he basically recollected these two texts, and he created this autobiography that was written by Stewart, but never was properly kind of finalized and finished by himself. And he was a big friend of uh, Hertrud Stein and Alice B. Toklas, and he also was um, a, a, a person kind of who lived a life of a university professor, and then he became a tattoo artist, and then he became a writer of gay pornography uh, novels. And it's basically like, uh, it's a fascinating, fascinatingly written and fascinating life that he lived and the, the ability of speak about things that is absolutely incredible because the book is written in the 70s and I think with this openness and with this honesty he uh, probably uh, like I, he impacted me uh, significantly it's it's a, a kind of academic not academic book but it is like in this in between where where, where the re- this reading is so beneficial for both, I think, uh, for for academics and for just uh, readers who are not interested in the academic texts. Uh, so yes, and right now, but I I cannot recommend anything. I just started a few days ago. Is the Shugi Bain? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if it's good or bad, but so far I just uh, read uh, fifteen pages and I like it. But I don't know for uh, like I not yet uh, give any. A definitive uh, answer on that, but it it used to be a, a, a big uh, thing a few months ago. So I think you got to answer or something. Yeah, yeah, won the booker, I think. And um, and for you, Joe, uh, what current is it? Mainly visual art that you engage with, or are there other media that that's important to you? Um, yeah, it there's a, there's a lot of um, kind of. Because I'm in the, the street art world, I would always kind of uh, lend myself um, to that sphere. Um, 
there's not a you know kind of a, a high proportion of of female street artists uh, thank god mm-hmm. in ireland there is a few that are that have started to come through which is great uh, there's even less queer artists uh, or mm-hmm. openly queer artists i remember a for the 50th uh, anniversary of the Stonewall riots, there was a few of us that were brought over. So that was lovely to meet um, to meet others that were, you know, kind of openly visible. Uh, there's some of my mates that have uh, recently um, transitioned uh, that, that are in the street art community. Um, so that's nice. And their work is very much reflected of, or reflective of, of their journey and who they are. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, kind of, uh, I was trying to wreck my head as Evgeny was talking and think of what I'm reading at the minute, but uh, I've just uh, <laughs> I've just finished teaching the leaving search for through the lockdown, so <laughs> my my head is in in a bit of mush. Uh, I'd always dip back into the great artists, so you know, kind of, I'd always love to to go back into the works of of um, Da Vinci and and you know, kind of those beautiful established artists. There was a uh, some great articles online that I, that I had read about. Uh, yeah, um, there were some great ar- articles that I read online recently about St. Sebastian um, mm. and the way he was seen as the patron saint of, of homosexuality because the arrows had penetrated his body and he hadn't died for them, from those arrows. And we thought that it might come up. depicted near naked. So, oh, so it was the, yeah. the one yeah. image of beautiful young naked male flesh you were going to see in 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 churches for for hundreds of years yeah 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 um and then it was it was funny to read that uh and then the correlation between the the plague at the time and what we were going through now with covid um so it was that airborne disease or they thought that it was that and it wasn't actually an airborne disease at all that killed him or that that tried to kill him um Mm -hmm. so yeah that was kind of i i always find a you know, kind of move between things and it always kind of supports yeah. or, or aids what I produce. Oscar Wilde took on the name Stephen Melmoth um, once he left Reading Jail, kind of in homage to, well, it was Melmoth the Wanderer from, from the, the novel by Sheridan Le Fanu, I think. Um, uh, um, uh, and also Stephen being the, the kind of the gay martyr. Um, and yeah, do you, I wanted to ask you? I think if, one of the hard- just a second. Uh, I, I remember that from that book of Samuel Stewart that maybe will in the it's it's just an anecdote. But he was uh, being very young. He was at some conference where some American writer was saying that when he was young, that writer who was already old, he was uh, Walt Whitman came and put the head. Uh, his hand on the head of that boy and said like something good to, to him because he was reading his poetry or something and uh, so Stuart uh, he came to that old man and he said I'm very sorry but, but can I put my hand on your head because I want, I want also touch the something that Walt Whitman touched and uh, mm-hmm. then he, he he never stops there. He said, and then I saw I need to write to Bozzi, and he wrote to Bozzi, and he actually met Alfred Douglas. I will stop there, but I would really recommend you to read at least that chapter because it is very interesting. <laughs> it's speaking about Oscar Wilde. Wow, Lord Alfred Douglas, yes. so the big love of his life, Bozzi. Yeah, he turned yeah. out to mm-hmm. marry a woman, father children, become a Tory. So yeah, I'm not. I'm not so sure. I want to know any more about him. <laughs> we're, we're oh yeah, it. do do read that chapter. It's very funny. It's very funny. He's he's um, he's on our side. I would say. Uh, Sammy, Thanks, not no, Bozzi, no, not Bozzi, no, 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 no. So, so we, we're getting a question in. Um, uh, Elizabeth Ker- Kerwin is asking. So how is one of the I thought one of the main art forms we were all going to be talking about was music. Um, we haven't quite mentioned music yet. So for you, Ruby, what kind of music would you like? And and also, do you find that it's a way to liberate your queer soul, to liberate your trans femininity? Is music at all important I, to you or not? Um, kind of. I love I love Lady Gaga. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love her. And she seems very like you know mutual. You know, like you know, you know, she's very supportive. I think to the gay and trans and all them communities. You know what about? Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, and, and I, I think... song "Born This Way." What do you think of that in particular? Do um, I love that song actually. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trans, but, but it does seem to me to be, you know, potentially a great trans anthem. Yeah. Yeah. And for you, Joe, is music part of, of your practice in any way? Uh, all of my really I don't, close I don't friends. Know if I mean, your practice of being gay or your practice of being an educator or your practice <laughs> of being a street artist. <laughs> yeah, it's always on. Uh, yeah. My my mates would always have like the worst taste in music. Like it's appalling. Like it's it's shockingly bad. Um, I I I'd listen to the radio. I don't really necessarily have anyone that I'd necessarily go to. Uh, mm-hmm. My best mate and and I went to Glastonbury there a couple of years ago. I was oh, in wow. charge of you know kind of getting around and and he was in charge of the, the bands and bringing me to where he thought I'd have a bit of crack and. It's fine because I don't take ownership of it, and um, yeah, and so I. It, but then it also does influence me. So, like, if you look at Lil Nas and what he's doing at the minute, and the way he has been so front and center about being gay, and he is, mm-hmm. you know, kind of another, another, you know, kind of ethnic minority, you know, kind of a, a young black gay man, and he's absolutely looking you down the barrel of the lens, and he's saying, "Yeah, this is this is who I'll kiss. This is who I'll be." This is and mm-hmm. it is power. It is you know complete yeah. power. And the same thing uh, when Ruby was talking about the gang that's in pose. Those are not straight or you know kind of actors that are pretending to be something else. It's yeah. genuine. They are they are them. And that's mm-hmm. I don't mean mm-hmm. to be putting words in Ruby's mouth, but it is it's a true representation. You can go from that program. You can follow those lives online. You can see their voices being amplified and. And listen to them as they bring you into the nuance of, of you know that that group and and that world, and it's mm-hmm. lovely, um, and it's so authentic, and that's why it's so you know kind of uh, appealing. Well, for me anyway, to you know to be allowed to step into that world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel you're being reliably taken care of by the women and from Pose, I think, and brought into the. It's interesting the kind of the the actresses in yeah sorry Joe yeah it, it's honest you know it's an honest representation yeah. of, of of life in in New York at the time and and you know kind of life that was that was there and and the balls and it, it's you know kind of you know the the RuPaul drag element of it that has made it now that brings you back and gives you the history gives you the context gives mm-hmm. you. The you know kind of Paris is burning those those words those you know kind of darling and you know you know those kind of those comments that we just kind of throw around and um, that's our culture and it's nice yeah. to be able to be shown the, our heritage um, mm-hmm. and to be shown our heritage not you know like I was up to that little television it's it's front and center it's on you know kind of people are consuming it at, at a great rate mm-hmm. yeah great. And if Kenny, um, sorry, Ruby, yeah. Um, also, I think I look up to a lot of Marsha P. Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, you were black trans women that fought for the rights, the gay rights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I feel like it was, it was very sad what happened that she also got murdered. You know, you know, I, yeah. you know I watched the documentary and stuff. It was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, you know, those documentaries are now available. I saw that on, on Netflix again, you know, and yeah. um, it, it for, for me, I mean, it was such a beautifully made documentary and, and you got to kind of meet her family and and really hear about her from being a girl um, uh, and also just how instrumental she was in the Stonewall riots and the instrumental in that word that Evgeny says he's not so sure of, community building. Like she was such a community person. She lived her heart open and on the streets and and actively looking after younger trans and actively look, look, try to find buildings for, for people to live in. Um, yeah. Um, and it is amazing too to see her life 
captured in film. Like we can actually see her image. It's not yeah. just somebody writing a story about her with a couple of it's photographs. Sure. Actually see her, yeah, inhabiting the world. So that's then again in terms of kind of queer history, that's relatively new for us um we have you know, footage of, of of such heroes or heroines like marsha Lee. so f- for you evgeny is does music play any part yeah just to clarify i In... wasn't speaking about community building i said that i have an issue with the very idea of the community and uh, but i i don't think we have time and space right now to to go into that debate, uh, uh, it's a long, it's a long one. Uh, as for the music, I, I, I don't know. I think it's it's so situational for me. Music, I'm quite illiterate uh, in in when it comes to music, but I do, I do like symphonical music and I do like academic music. I I. I I really feel like it appeals to me when, whenever the word, when it's a song and it's a word, I would rather and uh, have a tendency to listen to the words rather than to the music itself. So that's why I prefer have these two things uh, separated and enjoy music when it's not mixed with words. Uh, uh, so yes, so I, uh, recently, like, Schumann would be my my main uh, companion, but I don't know if it was queer or not. I don't think so. I don't know. It it has never been linked for me uh, directly, but I would agree with with uh, with everyone here that we have to recognize the contribution of the uh, of the musicians, of the pop musicians, especially uh, uh, not just Lady Gaga, who is also she did a lot, you know, in certain contexts, but, you know, Sarah Elton John, I think, also contributed a lot to the emancipation of uh, <sighs> we, uh subject that I would uh, mm-hmm. associate myself with. I think he also helped me to find a way out, you know. Mm. And uh, uh, it he, he is not seen maybe yet <laughs> as this contributor, but I think he is, uh, effectively. He, I think he is. So Especially so the way he for, for people with HIV is, is remarkable, and, and he's keeping doing, so I, I do think we need to acknowledge his contribution, not only as a musician. But also. Yeah, so as Ruby was saying with kind of Lady Gaga too, it's not just the music, but also the kind of... Uh, overt political statements and activities that, that yeah are important so joe also, i just um, have to ask yeah. sorry ruby yeah also i watched a movie called a girl like gwen it's about a transgender woman she was she came from a religious catholic family she lived um i think she was a latino and she was living out some part of america or somewhere like that it's called gwen anyways a girl like me and it's about a girl that is trans like a very pretty trans woman and ends up getting murdered uh, it's based on a true story by five men, four or five men, I think. Yeah, like they beat her for hours, stuff like that, you know. It was like, it was a very, I think it's a good movie, like I suggest people to watch, you know. And her mother continues, mm-hmm. her mother continues still today to fight for the transgender rights wherever, where they live, to get me. And basically, yeah. um, you know, the mother didn't accept the fact that the daughter was trans, the twin was trans, tra- trans, and it was hard for her, but she ended up accepting in the end, and she ends up getting murdered. But it's sad, but it's also very good. It's a good movie to watch. You know what about? Yeah, I'm. Um, so, so Richard uh, O'Leary um, has has put in a question there uh, or a comment. So um, he's he's spelling out Samuel Stewart. Sam Stewart has inspired a new queer edited book called Sam's Eden. Um, so if you if you look for um, the recommendation that Evgeny's made about the autobiography of Samuel Stewart, you can also afterwards check out a book called Sam's Eden by Thomas Wells, uh, Catalyst Arts Belfast. It's going to be launched next Thursday in Belfast. Um, 
So the contributors are queer activist artists and also including Richard O'Leary. That's great, uh, Richard. So hopefully we'll be able to to find, I, I imagine that's going to be an online. Um, let us know if it's online and if we can attend virtually. Or do we need to be at Catalyst Arts in Belfast next, next Thursday? So, um, uh, so Paul is asking a question and he's kind of a little bit cautious about asking it, but he's, he's going to put it out there. Um, um, when he sees pronouns after a name like he, him or she, her, what does it tell me about the persons? Is it an indicator of trans or of solidarity with trans or nothing to do with trans, just to avoid any confusion? So It's to do with trans and and some cisgender females on like TikTok on the social media accounts put down she, her the pronouns. Uh, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of cisgender people are starting to do that. But most likely it started with transgender women like like they she, her and then they, them and then he and him. Yeah, and, and also um, people are encouraged to show that they are allied as well with, with trans um, communities by signaling their pronouns that they prefer to be called. Um, that it's yeah. not just up to trans people to have to announce their preferred pronouns, that if we all do it, then it, it's going to be easier for trans people to to uh, announce preferences. Um, yeah. So so I hope that kind of clears up that whole. It's both. It's kind of for trans people to announce their identities and also trans allies to to normalize that practice of of declaring what kind of uh, gender pronouns you'd like to be called by. Um, so Aoife McKenna was wondering if anybody has any experience or could comment on queer fan fiction writing. Um, she's curious about the disruptive potential of deliberately queering popular cishet cultural artifacts. And she's loving the talk. I don't know if you guys know anything about, um, it used to be called slash fiction. Um, um, so started out also, on the internet. Yeah. Ruby? Also, I feel like a lot of people in like all different places, like Ireland, England, all over the world, used to use queer as an insult to people that are actually qu- like queer, which wasn't an insult, but they used to call it. I, I like, I really have no understanding in that part. But do you have any? Or... Yeah, I guess kind of. I do remember that there was a debate way back in the nineties, um, in the pages of GCN about using the word queer. So it kind of kicked off in, in a supplement call, um, that was produced in Quark called the Munster LGCN. And a number of us um, were arguing that we should reclaim the word queer. So, you know, like the K word that's used against travellers um, yeah. or the N word that's used against African-Americans, that there's, a, if you're from those kind of despised communities, that you claim that word back for yourself so it can't be used to, uh, in the same way to hurl and hurt you. Um, yeah. yeah. Any of you guys familiar with queer fan fiction? Any? No? I have very uh, superficial knowledge, but I, I do, uh, I did read a lot about uh, Harry Potter and Draco Malfoy and uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, intercourses that they had in different parts of Hogwarts, but also uh, about Frodo and Sam. And, you know, in, in general, I think that there is a, a lot of uh, uh, emancipation again in this uh, fanfix and in this writing. And I think we have to be very grateful to those people who contribute to our, uh, uh, you know, understanding of the main in the books uh, especially and very often these books would be connected to uh, uh, a reading that is happening around your young adulthood. So I think it's very interesting that it is somehow interlinked and connected and developed into that. And uh, I'm impossible to articulate things that are already somehow in in both sagas, in the Lord of the Rings and in the Harry Potter. We do find this sort of you know, motives, but then fanfic has the liberty, the the unauthorized liberty to do uh, to go much further. So I, I do I I do like 
the idea, but I haven't read that much. Uh, uh, only these things that kind of maybe just uh, very on the on the very top of the you know the the, the, the fan fiction. Yeah, but I'm sure there's yeah, much. I, more. Yeah, I do have a friend who's been mm-hmm. writing in in that world, that online world of fan fiction for. And it was like what she's telling me about it is is the the amount of solidarity and community of readers um that you find for the fiction that you write on it and the kind of the games and the prompts and the the collaborations between visual artists and and authors that seems to me to be kind of the best of what the internet can provide you know that that it can be a space where creative people can practice creativity under initially perhaps an anonymity, um, not in a public way, and kind of find their 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 juices, their voices, and their develop their skills. So it's one of the things I quite like about it. Um, and also, of course, there's the if you like the success stories of how writers who've queered um, particular popular movie, um, uh, particular popular. Um, um, TV series have got invited to be part of the writing teams for future episodes. So that's kind of a, an exciting thing as well to see how how that space of of queering can actually be be brought into kind of de- actually develop the stories. I think it happened with Xena, the Warrior Princess. Which I don't know if anybody here besides me is old enough and lesbian enough to have. Um, waited with bated breath for the next episode of Xena the Warrior Princess. It was this really schlocky thing that came out of New Zealand. Um, an absolute goddess, Lucy Lawless, was Xena, and she had a sidekick, Gabrielle. Um, <clears throat> and so there was lots of kind of queering of a relationship that seemed to me to need absolutely no extra imagination or queering. It was just so obvious that they were a femme butch couple. Um, but it wasn't actually obvious to the TV creators themselves until they discovered um, uh, this kind of subculture of, of lesbians busy, busily imagining what uh, Zena and Gabrielle got up to once the cameras stopped rolling. Um, and some of those uh, writers indeed were taken on to develop the, the series that did get more queer. Um, so we've got very little time left, just just about kind of five minutes or so. Um, um, I do have kind of one question, and it is specifically for Joe. Um, actually, two questions for Joe, but I think we can all bear with just him being the focus in our final moments, seeing as, as he is both an arts educator and a practitioner. So one, what... What are your musical preferences that are so bad? I really have to find out. Is it Big Tom and the Mainliners? Is it Ross Common's <laughs> Best Country and Western? And two, you know, when you're going in as an educator to young people and you're the, the arts teacher, um, what, what kind of things do you hope that they'll get from taking art classes or, 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 or what do you hope to do as a, as a teacher of art? So I know that's a really big, but I want that to be an open-ended question. I, I think the best, the best answer to that is that art is secondary to what you, you teach in the classroom. So I teach in a, in a school where we're a deaf school. It's a disadvantaged school. We have, you know, kind of lots of kids from lots of different types of backgrounds that would be very similar to Ruby, that would be, you know, kind of, from all different aspects of, of life. And art really is just the thing that is occupying them while we have big discussions. So right. we could talk. I, I remember that I did a piece on consent and I did a piece on consent because three girls were in my class and they'd come in at break time and lunchtime and they'd just sit in and like use my microwave and my fridge and just take over the place and leave the place in a mess and walk out the door. And every day I'd have like, clean up. like, but. <laughs> They came in one day, they were after hearing about um, a case where a, a, a young woman was told she was asking for it by the type of underwear that she happened to have on the day that she was raped. Yeah. Um, and they came down to my classroom furious and they were like, 
so while we talked about the artwork or while we were, you know, talking about the, the trial, we were making artwork and that became secondary. So the bigger thing that was happening in the classroom was about consent and it was about, you know, kind of their understanding of, of what it meant and them telling me and them trying to understand it. And then they seen it in their world and they go, well, your man now, when I was down, you know, kind of in the nightclub there or in the, the youth disco there a couple of months ago, he, I told him and he didn't. And then she came over and helped me. And, you know, so they mm-hmm. took big mm-hmm. things and it's how you distill very, very big questions. And the art happens because you have to teach a curriculum, but it's always better when it's maybe secondary to the bigger, wider understanding of what it is to live. You see, if I just went into the classroom and taught that, you know, kind of complementary colours or colours that are opposite to each other, that these kids know that they'd never put on a top that's orange and a pair of pants that's pink. And if they do, great, because it might, it might work also. But, mm. you know, kind of you're teaching, you're teaching a language uh, that's, that's so important to life. Um, and you're teaching about how to understand things. And you're also teaching about how to display things. Um, and it's, yeah, I kind of, that's how I have always approached art in my classroom. Uh, how I approach music is like, <laughs> it's appalling. It's, so I might, I might hear one song that I like, and then I might buy the album on, on, you know, online and I'll listen to it 400 times and there'll be nothing else. And I listen to it so much that I actually hate it at that point. <laughs> and then I do the same thing over again. Yeah, that doesn't seem too appalling to me. I've actually worn out um, Joni Mitchell's Blue album twice <laughs> on vinyl and CD. And I hear something different, I think, nearly every time I play it. So, yeah, that, 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 OK, we're, we're similar. So that's OK, Joe. Um, <laughs> and. Um, Okay, we're coming up towards, we've only about a minute and a half left, unfortunately. Um, I'd love to be in your, your class, Joe. That sounds a really good way to, to teach anything. But um, uh, anybody like to say any final words? Ruby, would you like to say anything before we close? Um, it was nice to meet, nice to meet you. And um, you know, it, was, it was good to be involved in this and everything, you know. Thanks. And, um, yeah. Just to spread awareness, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, you're a pioneer, aren't you? And I hope that my wish for 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 trans represent trans female representation is that it seems to me to be on a very similar arc to how representations of lesbians were back in the nineties, which is we we all ended up murdered and killed. Like they were the only stories that kind of got out. And and while there's a strong truth in that and those things need to be recognised, I'd also hope that other stories get told and, and told more loudly um, uh, and we see more, more diversity of, of trans women's experiences. That would be my, my wish. Um, for example, I don't watch Orange is the New Black because that would be my fifth lesbian prison series I just thought I can't do any more I can't do any more I, I and now and now I can see lesbians in other places besides prison dramas so yeah I wish I wish the same thing for trans uh, women so Evgeny would you like to say any final words I think you know I think I've said enough uh, but thank you very much for that conversation and for, to you for your moderation and to other speakers it was very uh, euristic uh, yeah, I'd love to hear Schumann being played in the George sometime. So, yeah. Um, and and Joe, any final words from you? Yeah, I'd just like to echo what the what other speakers have said. It was, uh, thank you very much. Um, it was great. It was nice to hear everybody's experience. And we all come from, you know, kind of quite different backgrounds, but we're all linked absolutely by, you know, kind of being part of this community. And it's it's a great one to be part of. Yeah. I think so too. The the queer superpower of empathy. I'm going to hang on to that, Joe. Thanks for giving us that tonight. All right, everybody. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us. And um, uh, thanks for all the questions and comments. And good luck with that launch, Richard, uh, on Thursday. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.